My favorite definition of ecology states that ecology is the scientific study of the processes influencing the distribution and abundance of organisms, the interactions among organisms, and the interactions between organisms and the transformation and flux of energy and matter. And this definition emphasizes several aspects of what we've learned about ecology. Ecology is a starting focus on organisms, aggregations of organisms, or systems incorporating organisms or their byproducts. And ecology is bounded by both the biological and the physical sciences. And that means there's a lot of subject matter breadth within the field of ecology, because we consider both the biotic and the abiotic aspects of nature. And depending on the ecological specialty, the focus can be on different proportions of biotic or abiotic aspects of nature. And the relationships between organisms and the physical world can be bidirectional, although different specialties may emphasize the effect of organisms or the effects of the physical world. And in general, ecologists focus on processes, interactions, and relationships rather than focusing on single physical entities. And this definition should fit with what we've learned so far when we've talked about population ecology, community ecology, and ecosystem ecology. Population ecology has a focus on organisms. Community ecology has a focus on aggregations of organisms. And ecosystem ecology starts incorporating all of those abiotic aspects into the field. And one of the best ways to truly understand the different levels of ecology is to look at a real-world example of how ecologists study a specific site. And so here we're going to learn about ecology as a whole through the waters of Lake Mendota. Not only should this solidify your understanding of ecology, but it should give you a better appreciation of your next-door neighbor. So what's so special about Madison? Well, I would argue the lakes make this city pretty unique. Here's a beautiful photo taken from an airplane showing the isthmus of Madison. You can see that this unique city is bounded between two beautiful lakes. And it's important to the people living in this city that these lakes are healthy ecosystems. And there's been scientific interest in the lakes of Madison for a long time. UW-Madison is actually considered one of the birthplaces of limnology. And limnology is the study of inland waters. And limnology at UW-Madison started with Burge and Jude back in the late 1800s. And you're probably familiar with the name Burge. It's what Burge Hall is named after. And here's a photo of Burge and Jude collecting plankton on a Wisconsin lake in 1920. And right off the bat, I'll tell you it's not just me who loves lakes. Ecologists in general love lakes. Do you have any idea why lakes are probably disproportionately popular in the field of ecology? Well, one reason is that early on, lakes gained notoriety for being considered microcosms of larger ecosystems. And what I mean by this is lakes were thought to be pretty isolated in their boundaries. This is in comparison to a forest, which maybe stretches on forever. Lakes, and especially small lakes, have very distinct boundaries. And so it was thought by ecologists that it would be a lot easier to study all of the processes going on in a lake than perhaps all of the processes going on in a forest. And this was a pretty interesting and attractive approach. And to this day, there is a paper from 1887 called The Lake as a Microcosm that is still talked about to this day. Consider how organisms move. Lakes are indeed more closed than terrestrial or even ocean biomes, and this makes them suitable for ecological studies, since we can assume that most organisms remain in the lake throughout their life, and so we can ignore things like immigration and emigration, although these do happen. And lakes were also one of the first places that ecologists started thinking about energy flows. This is a famous diagram from a 1942 paper published on the trophic dynamic aspects of ecology where Raymond Lindemann studied the succession of Cedar Creek Bog in northern Minnesota and provided a whole new way of viewing aquatic systems through the idea of energy flow. And this was only six years after the word ecosystem was even coined. And what's remarkable is the longevity of this approach. 
This insight on energy flow allowed researchers to aggregate and organize some of the complexity of aquatic ecosystems. As you can see in this food web, everything is connected. But viewing lakes as microcosms is pretty simplified, and we know that lakes are actually integrators of their watersheds. And so while lakes might be microcosms compared to a terrestrial environment, they are by no means isolated. They are very connected to both the atmosphere and the landscape. And so ecologists who study lakes are interested not just in the lake itself, but also in the lake's watershed. And this is an area of land where precipitation collects and drains off into a common outlet, in this case a lake. And so here's an image of the Ahara watershed. This is the watershed that encompasses the five major lakes in Madison. So any precipitation that falls in this boundary, or any pollutant that's put down onto the ground, or any fertilizer, is going to run off eventually into our lakes. So here's a land use map of just the Lake Mendota watershed. And if you've ever traveled north of Lake Mendota, you're probably familiar with the landscape. Most of the watershed is still agricultural, but there's about 22% urban land use. And this is heavily concentrated into the west of Madison and especially the Middleton area. But Dane County is growing in population and this urban land use continues to expand at the expense of agricultural land. And one thing that we haven't covered yet when talking about different fields of ecology is the idea of time and that history matters. Present day ecology is shaped and formed by what's happened to that landscape in the past. And so understanding the history of a location can be really important to understanding the population or community dynamics that are happening today. And so if we're thinking about Lake Mendota specifically, it's good to know the history of the Ahara watershed. So the Ahara watershed's first human inhabitants likely arrived after the glaciers receded around 12,000 years ago. And they found the region's soil rich and its lakes and wetlands abundant with fish and other resources which persuaded these nomadic hunter-gatherers to settle here. Archaeological evidence, such as effigy mounds and Native American oral traditions, indicate this region was the spiritual center of early cultures. The land ultimately became home to the Ho-Chunk tribe, who referred to it as Dejop, or the Four Lakes region. And the Ho-Chunk managed and used Yahara's land through prairie burning, hunting, fishing, and agricultural practices, which left a mark on the region's landscapes and ecosystems although to a much lesser extent than the incoming Euro-American settlers. When the Euro-American settlers began with the arrival of fur traders in the 17th century, trade, disease, and conflict dramatically altered Ho-Chunk society. Eventually, they were forcibly removed from the region. And the permanent settlement of Euro-Americans in the 1820s led to significant changes in the Ahara watershed. By 1880, settlers had converted about 75% of the native prairie and oak savanna landscape to cropland and pasture. Today's percentage is actually lower since urban land use has replaced some former cropland. This conversion from erosion-resistant prairie sod to tilled bared ground led to substantial erosion. Farmers cultivated primarily wheat because it was relatively easy and cheap to produce, and grist mills produced flour for mostly local markets until the railroads enabled exportation in the 1850s. By the 1870s, wheat disease, market pressure, and soil nutrient depletion caused by continuous wheat coverage, had driven Yahara farmers to diversify their crops. Following groundbreaking research at the University of Wisconsin, dairy emerged as a way to replenish depleted soil nutrients via the use of manure as fertilizer and to provide farmers with more reliable income. Still today, dairy operations dominate the agricultural landscape in the Yahara watershed. And while dairy has provided an economic livelihood to the region, it's come at a cost to our fresh waters. And while we're going to focus on Lake Mendota here and aquatic ecosystems in general, the terrestrial landscape also provides a lot of important ecosystem services that are of interest to ecologists. Here's an example of ecosystem services of the Ahara watershed. You can see that the landscape provides a lot of provisioning services, such as crop production, pasture, and freshwater supply. Also cultural services, since like forest recreation and hunting. And also regulating services, like carbon storage, groundwater quality, soil retention, and flood regulation. But now we're going to turn to look specifically at Lake Mendota through the eyes of an ecologist. Hopefully you've had the chance to sit beside the shores of Lake Mendota. But maybe not on a warm, still summer day, 
where dense phytoplankton blooms have pushed towards the shore, creating a gross, noxious smell that permeates the terrace. But if you were sitting there, hopefully you'd ask yourself the question, why are these phytoplankton blooms happening? Has it always been this way? Is it getting worse? Is this the result of biotic interactions or abiotic interactions? Well, ecology can help answer these questions. And it's actually difficult to know where to start when thinking about the ecology of Lake Mendota, because there's so much going on. There have been hundreds of limnologists who have studied Lake Mendota over the last century, and they've all focused on slightly different aspects of the system. Ecologists study abiotic factors that shape the lake habitat, like temperature and water chemistry. They also study population ecology, thinking about microbes, or phytoplankton, or zooplankton, or fish. Ecologists also study community interactions in the lake, so interspecific interactions between different populations, say between zooplankton and fish, or between microbes and phytoplankton. And importantly, community ecologists also study invasive species. How are invasive species changing interspecific interactions? And then we also study the ecosystem, thinking about the interactions between abiotic and biotic factors, especially the biogeochemistry of the lake. Thinking about those nutrient cycles that we looked at, phosphorus and nitrogen and carbon. And then the elephant in the room is obviously climate change. What's going to happen to this lake in the future as temperatures get warmer, as we get more precipitation, as winter becomes shorter? Well, to start answering these questions, we're going to start by looking at the trophic structure of the lake. And a really simple food chain in most lakes in this area looks a lot like the one pictured on the right. At the base of the food chain are phytoplankton. These are photosynthetic organisms that capture light energy from the sun. Phytoplankton are then consumed by zooplankton, who are then consumed by fishes that we call planktivores. These are secondary consumers. But we also have fish that we call piscivores that are fish-eating fish, and these would be tertiary consumers. And so we can think of these piscivores as our apex predators, although in reality humans are often the apex predator, as humans are very effective at capturing fish. And so when we learned about trophic structures, we learned that there could be bottom-up controls and top-down controls, both of which control the size of the populations of organisms. And in lakes, the bottom-up controls are considered things like solar radiation, how much energy is available for phytoplankton. Also things like temperature. Temperature is really important in controlling cellular processes. And things like phytoplankton can grow a lot more quickly in warm waters. Also oxygen. All of these organisms need oxygen to breathe. But we don't usually consider oxygen a limiting factor in terrestrial ecosystems, but it can definitely limit the presence of life in aquatic ecosystems. And also nutrients. Nutrients are really important in limiting phytoplankton growth. If we have a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen in our waters, we tend to see a lot of phytoplankton. But we also have top-down control, and we can consider this predation, or perhaps harvest of fish by humans. If there's lots of predation, these populations are going to be limited in how big they can get. And remember, predation occurs at multiple levels in this food chain. Zooplankton are predating on phytoplankton. Planktivores are predating on zooplankton. And so we can get populations limited by predation at different levels. Here's another way of looking at a simplified aquatic food web. This one gives a better representation of maybe how many organisms are needed at each level to support that top predator. In this case, we have primary producers, the phytoplankton, supporting the primary consumers, the zooplankton. And we also have prey fish and predator fish. And you can see in this example, there's not just one apex predator. There are multiple fish species coexisting in these ecosystems because usually they live in slightly different habitats. That is, they have different niches. And in general, this diagram does a really good job at showing just how much primary production is needed to support these higher levels in the food chain. Remember trophic efficiency? Only about 10% of energy is passed up to each trophic structure. So to create all that biomass needed for, say, a big muskie, we need a lot of primary production. Here's an energy flow diagram for the Lake Mendota ecosystem. And this energy flow diagram was made over 35 years ago, but things are still the same. You can see that the lake receives a lot of energy from solar radiation but only a small percentage of that is then converted into biomass and phytoplankton. And again, only a small percentage of that phytoplankton energy is passed on to zooplankton, and an even smaller percentage is passed on to fish. 
And so you can quickly see what might be limiting fish growth in lakes. And in this diagram, there's a lot of other processes, especially biogeochemical processes going on. But one thing that's important to note is that bacteria play a pretty large role in this food web. And that awareness, the awareness that microbes play a really large role in aquatic ecosystems, has led to a large field of study into microbial biology in lakes. And so there's a lot of active research going on, including a lot here on campus, looking at the role that bacteria play in things like nutrient cycling. So to better understand population and community ecology in Lake Mendota, it's important to understand the basics of phytoplankton, so these are the primary producers, zooplankton, these are the primary consumers, and fish that take the role of secondary and tertiary consumers. So what are phytoplankton? Well, phytoplankton are photosynthetic organisms, and they're very small. They're microorganisms that are suspended and adapted to live partially or continuously in open water. And while we often think of phytoplankton as algae, as the plants of the aquatic ecosystem, they are both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. We have cyanobacteria, which are photosynthetic microbes that make up, in some cases, a large proportion of phytoplankton in lakes. And cyanobacteria are not technically algae because they're not eukaryotes, but they perform a lot of the same functions in the ecosystem. And phytoplankton are small but mighty. They range in size over five orders of magnitude, from less than 0.2 micrometers to 20,000 micrometers in size, some that you can almost see with the naked eye. And phytoplankton are everywhere. They're found in almost all of the major lineages in the eukaryotic tree of life. They're composed of nearly every major taxonomic group. And there's some estimates that there's about four to 5,000 species of marine phytoplankton, and this number is probably pretty similar to the number of freshwater phytoplankton species that exist. But take a minute to think about that. There might be 4,000 species of freshwater phytoplankton. How can so many of these species coexist? We've learned in communities that species have both fundamental and realized niches. But with that many species, you'd think that only some species would survive. There'd be competition, right? and only the fittest species would be left. We've learned that the principle of competitive exclusion states that one species should outcompete the others. And so how do we end up with so many phytoplankton species? Well, this has been a really important question in the field for a long time. This is a paper published in 1961 called The Paradox of the Plankton, and it addresses just that. How can there be so many species of phytoplankton? How can an ecosystem with a limited range of resources support an unexpectedly wide range of species, apparently flouting the competitive exclusion principle? There should be winners and losers that winnow down the number to a handful of the best competitors. Well, there's a few hypotheses that try to address the paradox of the plankton. Often overlooked is that for the competitive exclusion principle to hold true, the environment must be stable. And lakes are far from this. Lakes are continually changing due to climactic changes and inputs of terrestrial nutrients from storms. And research suggests that ecological and environmental factors continually interact such that the planktonic habitat never reaches an equilibrium for which a single species is favored. Also, phytoplankton have unique adaptations, such as resting stages and symbiotic relationships that negate competition. And there's also selective grazing by predators that might keep one species from dominating. So there you have it. The paradox of the plankton may no longer be a paradox, but it does highlight the breadth and complexity of both phytoplankton and lake habitats. And if we look at phytoplankton under a microscope, they are absolutely amazing. Look at the diversity in shapes and sizes of these phytoplankton taken from Lake Itasca, which is the headwaters of the Mississippi River. But while phytoplankton may look beautiful under a microscope, they don't look so beautiful at the surface. Here are two pictures of phytoplankton blooms, and we consider a bloom to be a big accumulation of phytoplankton at the surface of a lake. And these are two different species of cyanobacteria, a phanazomenon on the left and microcystis on the right. And what's especially important to know about cyanobacteria is they can potentially produce harmful toxins 
And these toxins can be both deadly to humans and especially to pets who are more likely to jump into this water and drink it. And so understanding the ecology of phytoplankton is important not just for basic understanding of the ecosystem, but for human health implications as well. So from the pictures of those phytoplankton blooms, we can tell that phytoplankton can grow really successfully and in large quantities. But what do we actually know about their population growth rates? Well, here's a graph of six different species of phytoplankton grown in a lab. And on the y-axis is the optical density, which can be considered an indirect measurement of biomass. And on the x-axis is cultivation time in days. And we can see that at the beginning, the cells grow almost exponentially. But they all hit what we can consider to be a carrying capacity. Something is limiting that population growth rate. These population curves look like our idealized logistic curves. And that's exactly what they are. These populations are growing really quickly until there's something that's limiting them to a specific carrying capacity. So in a lab experiment like the one just shown, scientists usually make sure that nutrients or light are not limiting maximum growth. But in a real aquatic ecosystem, both light and nutrients are often the limiting factors in phytoplankton growth. We can see in this graph on the right, this idealized growth rate continues to increase if the population is not light or nutrient limited. But eventually the growth rate plateaus, and this actually happens because of intercellular crowding. Basically that maximum growth rate is imposed by internal factors, physical constraints such as packing all the necessary molecular machinery into a really confined space. What we also see happening in a lake is that when there's a lot of phytoplankton, such in those bloom photos, the phytoplankton at the top actually shade out the phytoplankton at the bottom. And so the phytoplankton end up self-shading themselves, and so some of them become light-limited. Can you think of other situations in the real world where light would be limiting phytoplankton growth? Well, the most obvious one is nighttime, right? Phytoplankton can't photosynthesize at night when there's no sun. Also, what about in the winter, when the lakes are frozen with ice and covered in a lot of snow? Well, that snow is really effective in blocking light transmission into the water column. And so photosynthesis in the winter can be very, very low. And so sunlight can limit photosynthesis, as can temperature if temperatures are too cold for cellular processes to take place. But phytoplankton can also be limited by nutrients. And nutrients might be one of the most common limitations on algae growth, especially in the summer. Because in the summer, we often have warm really well-lit waters, and so sunlight and temperature are not the limiting factor in population growth. And to ecologists, nutrients are elements that are fundamental atomic building blocks for living organisms. We need nutrients to do things like build proteins and nucleic acids, as well as other molecules in our bodies. And the two nutrients that we talk about the most in ecology are nitrogen and phosphorus. And phosphorus is a common element on Earth but it's actually really rare in aquatic ecosystems. Most of the phosphorus on Earth is tied up in rocks, but it's essential for the creation of DNA. Remember that DNA is made up of a phosphate group? That's phosphorus. Also a sugar group and four types of nitrogen bases. Aha, there's that word nitrogen. And phosphorus is also important in photosynthesis, respiration, energy storage and transfer, cell division, and cell enlargement. And nitrogen is a major component of chlorophyll which is the most important pigment needed for photosynthesis, as well as a range of amino acids, which are the key building blocks of proteins. And so when we have an excess of nutrients, a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen in our lakes, this leads to a proliferation of phytoplankton, because nutrients are no longer limiting phytoplankton growth. And so Lake Mendota ends up looking like this in the summer, purely as a result of too high concentrations of nutrients. And where are all these nutrients coming from? Well, they're mostly coming from agriculture. You can see here some photos taken from the Ahara watershed. On the top left is manure that's been applied to a frozen field. And when that snow starts to melt, that manure runs off directly into the local stream. And that stream then drains into Lake Mendota. 
And so instead of that fertilizer being used to fertilize crops like it's intended to, it just ends up in the lake. Here's another picture of water flowing off an agricultural field directly into Pheasant Branch, which then goes on to feed into Lake Mendota. And so in this case, the rivers are conduits for nutrients. Nutrients are put down on the farm fields, often as manure. We have so many dairy cows that we have a lot of dairy cow poop to deal with, and the most inexpensive option is to put it back onto the field. Unfortunately, this ends up directly in our lakes. And this is not a new problem. We've been polluting our lakes with nutrients for over a hundred years. And so summers are now synonymous with green lakes. Here are satellite photos showing the color of the Madison lakes in the summer. These lakes are no longer blue the way they should be. They're full of phytoplankton. The phytoplankton populations are not being limited by those bottom-up controls, temperature, sunlight, and nutrients. And beyond all the problems that we see at the surface during big phytoplankton blooms, another devastating consequence happens below the surface where we can't see it. When phytoplankton die, their biomass is consumed by microbes. And those microbes feast on phytoplankton in Lake Mendota in the summer. But this process of decomposition uses up oxygen. Those microbes are respirating. And we've seen that the cellular respiration equation uses up oxygen. And so what we see is that Lake Mendota loses oxygen in the bottom of the lake during the summer. So here's a graph of oxygen saturation in Mendota between April and November 2019. And that area in purple is the area of the lake where there's no oxygen. And this oxygen consumption is a direct result of there being too many phytoplankton. And the problem with this is that it limits the habitat available for fish. Fish need oxygen to breathe. And also, a lot of fish love cold water and they want to be in the bottom of the lake. But if there's no oxygen in the bottom of the lake, those fish are forced to be at the surface in that warm water habitat. And we actually call this the oxythermal squeeze, where there's no good cold water habitat left for some of these fish species. And so we're actually seeing declines in cold water fish species in a lot of lakes in Wisconsin. Here's a picture of a pile of dead cisco on a Lake Mendota beach in the summer of 1987. These are fish that thrive in cold water. And if the cold water has no oxygen, the fish are going to die. So what can limit phytoplankton growth? Well, we already discussed that it could be limited by abiotic factors, such as temperature. We don't have as many phytoplankton growing in the winter as we do in the summer. But there's also biotic factors, those top-down controls, predation. And so in this case, phytoplankton growth can be limited by zooplankton. And here are pictures of three common species of zooplankton in freshwater lakes. And zooplankton are the animal component of the planktonic community. And the word zoo comes from the Greek word for animal. It's the same prefix that we have in zoology. And zooplankton are heterotrophic, meaning they cannot produce their own food, and therefore must consume other plants or animals. And in particular, this means that they eat phytoplankton. And zooplankton are generally larger than phytoplankton, but they're still microscopic and are better seen under a microscope. And zooplankton are a fan favorite of ecologists for a few different reasons. First off, there's a lot of different species, and these species have unique population dynamics. All zooplankton are our strategists, but they operate in different ways. Zooplankton are often thought of as herbivores, eating predominantly phytoplankton. But they also can predate on other zooplankton, and there's some zooplankton species that are strictly carnivores. Ecologists are also interested in parasitism and the parasites that are associated with zooplankton. And lastly, if you're a community ecologist, because of that amazing diversity of species, there's fascinating ecological questions to be asked about succession and competition. And while a lot of these same ecological principles can be asked about fish, fish are much longer-lived species, and we can study all of these processes in zooplankton with much shorter generation times you can see multiple generations of zooplankton per year. And so we can get a better idea of life history over a shorter duration of time than we could by studying larger organisms such as fish. And one really popular genus in the field of freshwater ecology is the zooplankton daphnia. And there are different species and subspecies of daphnia. 
but Daphnia are often considered a keystone species in lakes. They're a principal grazer of algae, bacteria, and protozoa, and they're a primary forage species for fish. And they're often used as an indicator to assess the response of ecosystems to environmental change. Here's a 40-year time series of Daphnia puacaria and Daphnia mendote population dynamics in Lake Mendota. And you can see that in some years, Daphnia puacaria are the dominant species of Daphnia in the summer. In other years, Daphnia mendote are dominant. And this is important because Daphnia puacaria are a much bigger species of Daphnia. And being a big species means you consume more phytoplankton, and it also means you're better food for fish. And so we consider years where there's a big Daphnia pulicaria population to be years where zooplankton are keeping phytoplankton populations in check. And you can see from these time series that both species have this sort of annual boom and bust dynamic. Their populations are very low over the winter, and then in the spring the populations increase rapidly. And this is because Daphnia are taking advantage of an ample food supply of phytoplankton blooming in the spring. And these population dynamics are well known, and we see them happening every year. If you ever stand near the shore of Lake Monona or Lake Mendota in the spring, it might look unusually clear. And that's due to interactions between population dynamics of phytoplankton and zooplankton. Once the ice comes off the lake in the spring, we see a big surge in phytoplankton biomass, almost exponential growth, but then that growth is limited by predation. And that predation is by zooplankton, who are also undergoing a big increase in biomass. But eventually, zooplankton eat all of the phytoplankton and run out of food, and their populations decrease as well. And so we see this boom-bust cycle in both phytoplankton and zooplankton in the spring. But that surge in zooplankton leads to what we call the clear water phase. It's this phase in the spring that lakes usually undergo, where the water quality is exceptionally clear. Here's a photo I took a few years ago from Lake Monona. You can see right to the bottom of the lake. And this is rare if you think about what the water quality of these lakes look like in the summer. And so these community interactions, the interaction between phytoplankton and zooplankton has direct impacts on the water quality. But unfortunately, the clear water doesn't last all that long. Because at the same time that zooplankton are eating all of the phytoplankton, those high population numbers can't be sustained because there's also predation on zooplankton. So you can see that these community interactions are becoming more complex. We're now adding zooplankton predators to the mix. And here are some examples of common predators. At the top you see a bluegill. This is a common fish that we have here in the Madison Lakes. And bluegill really like to eat zooplankton. We also have other predatory zooplankton that will eat zooplankton. So on the left we see a rotifer that actually has three other rotifers in its stomach. In the bottom middle we see leptodora. Just looking at that image looks scary, but Leptodora eat a range of zooplankton, including rotifers and daphnia. And on the right, we actually have the predatory larvae of the phantom midge Chaeoberus. And Chaeoberus is often considered a key factor for zooplankton community structure. And so while zooplankton are trying to grow and consume phytoplankton and keep our water clear, they're being predated on by a number of different organisms. And what ecologists have long found fascinating is that zooplankton have physiological adaptation to predators. And we often see these adaptations happening during seasonal changes when predators might appear or disappear. And we can term these cyclical changes cyclomorphosis, which is the occurrence of cyclical or seasonal changes in a phenotype of an organism through successive generations. And here's an example of a rotifer. This is a type of zooplankton. And you can see that there's extension of spines on that rotifer on the image on the right. And these spines are thought to ward off potential predators. And here's another example of cyclomorphosis from our favorite genus, Daphnia. You can see in this figure four generations of Daphnia. And in the bottom population, there are no predators. And the Daphnia through successive generations look pretty similar in terms of their overall morphology. However, in the top population, predators are present, and we can see that with successive generation, we get this really distinct helmet formation, and it's thought that this helmet might help to reduce predation. And there's other examples as well in other species of Daphnia. Daphnia pulex neonates can actually develop neck teeth. It's kind of as weird as it sounds. 
and these neck teeth reduce the susceptibility of the neonates to predation. As well as physiological adaptation to predators, there's also behavioral avoidance of predators. And a really common example in zooplankton is diel vertical migration. And diel is just a word that biologists use for things that happen on sort of a daily cycle. And so in diel vertical migration, we see that zooplankton move down in the water column during the day to avoid predation. During the day, there's lots of sunlight and predators are able to see the zooplankton really well. And so they move down into the darker water. But at night, when it's dark, the zooplankton move up to feed on all the good algae in the surface water. And so again, zooplankton have evolved this trait of diel vertical migration. Movement through the water column is energetically costly, so that movement has to bring some benefit, and the benefit is likely avoidance of predators. And this vertical migration can have an impact on the spatial and temporal structure of pelagic food webs, and also nutrient cycling. So let's take what we've learned so far about phytoplankton population dynamics and zooplankton populations and predation and put these all together in terms of both community ecology and thinking about the ecosystem and overall water quality. So let's think about an idealized lake where we have two alternative states. One state is we have really high algae, and that means there's probably poor water quality. Think of those pictures of Lake Mendota in the summer. There's lots of algae because there's not very many zooplankton to feed on them. And there's not very many zooplankton because there's a lot of zooplankton feeding fish. The other state is maybe we have really good water quality because we don't have very many algae and we have a lot of zooplankton. The zooplankton are keeping those algae numbers in check. And we have a lot of zooplankton because we don't have very many zooplankton feeding fish. So you can see two idealized hypothetical food webs here that are basically opposites. One has really low zooplankton numbers, and the other has really high zooplankton numbers. Again, we call Daphnia a keystone species in a lot of lakes, and this is the reason why. Daphnia numbers can keep phytoplankton in check and create a totally different ecosystem. And this concept of these two different states is interesting both just from a basic ecological understanding of how lakes work, but also for management purposes. So I'm going to talk about the Lake Mendota biomanipulation. So in the 1970, algae blooms were a pretty big problem in the lake, as they still are. And there was very low tertiary consumer populations. So the tertiary consumers in this case are the piscophores. These are the fish-eating fish, so those apex predators. And the hypothesis was, was that because there weren't very many piscivores, there was a lot of planktivores, a lot of secondary consumers, and those secondary consumers were not allowing zooplankton populations to get very big. And because the zooplankton populations were kept small, there was a lot of phytoplankton. So some ecologists decided that they were going to try stocking Lake Mendota with a lot of piscivores, so specifically with walleye and northern pike. And they were hoping that by increasing the number of piscivores, that would drive down the number of planktivores, increase zooplankton, and decrease phytoplankton, leading to better water quality. And so from 1987 to 1999, Lake Mendota was stocked with 2.7 million walleye and 170,000 northern pike. You could imagine that the local anglers were also very happy about this. So what happened? Well, apart from the experiment, there was actually a large die-off of cisco the year before stocking began. And cisco are a zooplanktivore, so they are a fish that ate zooplankton. And so this natural die-off was actually really good for the experiment. And we saw that in combination with the natural die-off of cisco, there was a declining yellow perch population. Total planktivore biomass dropped from about 3 to 600 kilograms per hectare prior to the die-off to about 20 to 40 kilograms per hectare in subsequent years. And these low planktivore biomasses lasted until a resurgence in the perch population in 1999. So the combination of stocking top predators and the Cisco die-off was intended to reconfigure the food web and trigger this trophic cascade that would increase zooplankton and specifically Daphnia populations to intensify algae grazing and thus reduce phytoplankton biomass and increase water clarity. So that was the theory. The question is, did it work? Well, it was indeed successful. This graph shows changes in Secchi disk depth during spring. We use Secchi disks to measure water clarity. And the deeper the Secchi disk goes, the better the water clarity. 
And so we see deeper Secchi disc depth during spring, early summer, and midsummer. And you can see that water clarity increased, especially during spring and summer. Fewer extreme blooms occurred, and in general the experiment was considered success. That is, that manipulating the food web could improve water quality. And this is only possible for our knowledge of both population and community ecology dynamics. But as you know if you've seen the lake in the last few years, it's still very green, and we've not seen the same water clarity as we did during the 1990s. And there seemed to be a particularly big change around 2008-2009, as you can see by this change in phytoplankton biomass shown in this graph. Notice this graph has a log scale on the y-axis, so this indicates an order of magnitude increase in phytoplankton biomass. So what happened in Lake Mendota in 2008-2009? Well, one thing that happened was that the food web changed due to the arrival and population explosion of the spiny water flea. And although the spiny water flea is a zooplankton species, this invader is not a grazer. It's not eating phytoplankton. Instead, it's a predator that eats other zooplankton, especially Daphnia. So here are some pictures of the spiny water flea also known as Bithotrephes longomanus. It's native to the freshwater lakes of Europe and Asia and made its way to the Great Lakes around 1984 and probably reached our lakes not too long after. Like Daphnia, which is also a type of water flea, spiny water fleas can either reproduce asexually to achieve very dense populations or sexually to produce hard resting eggs. And unfortunately, Daphnia are a favorite prey of the larger spiny water flea. They're actually pretty messy eaters they tear up and consume Daphnia in large numbers and can devastate their populations. So while the spiny water flea probably existed in low densities in Lake Mendota for decades, its population exploded after an unusually cool early summer in 2009. And this was disastrous for Daphnia pulicaria, the larger Daphnia species that's most effective at grazing phytoplankton. The water flea's success in 2009 allowed it to lay down a huge amount of resting eggs, and this has helped maintain the population in high densities since 2009. And it's also important to note that this long spiny tail deters fish from eating spiny water flea. So they have low predation and they're high consumers. A bad deal for lakes. So the predation pressure of spiny water flea actually acted to reverse the trophic cascade that the biomanipulation made by reducing Daphnia biomass and grazing pressure on phytoplankton and led to more phytoplankton blooms and lower water clarity. And so over this 30-year period of food web change, we've learned that food webs can be modified to enhance top-down controls on phytoplankton, but we shouldn't assume that these changes are enduring. Indeed, this story reminds us that food web approaches to controlling, say, bad water quality are really treating the symptom of algae blooms rather than the root cause of the problem, which is excess nutrients from the landscape we really need to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus if we want to solve this problem in the long term. And it doesn't stop there for poor Lake Mendota. We have a new addition, and these are zebra mussels. These mollusks are about the size of your fingernail, with dark zigzags on their shells that give them their name. They colonize any available hard surface. They take over rocks, piers, and even the hard shells of other organisms. And they were introduced into the Great Lakes in the 1980s from ballast water of cargo ships, similar to that of spiny water flea. So it really was it only a matter of time before humans would inadvertently transmit them to the Ahara watershed. And like spiny water flea, these invasive mollusks dramatically alter food webs. But in many ways, their impacts are even more pronounced. Zebra mussels are filter feeders. They suck water in and filter out all of the algae and microscopic animals for consumption. So their high numbers and ferocious feeding mean they're essentially sucking all of the nutrients out of the water column and shifting them to the bottom of the lake. This may sound good, but this increase in nutrients on the lake bed then encourages populations of bottom-dwelling organisms to boom alongside the invasive mussels. So by congregating the nutrients at the bottom of the lake, zebra mussels are changing the way food moves through Lake Mendota. And with clearer water, sunlight is also able to penetrate deeper, supporting huge algae growth on the lake bed. These massive thick mats of algae break off and end up washing onto the shores where they rot in smelly piles. Here's a video of what the near shore bottom of Lake Mendota currently looks like. You can see these huge swaths of algae growing at the bottom, 
thanks to nutrient relocation by zebra mussels. Another unfortunate trait of zebra mussels is while they do filter out phytoplankton, they actually avoid consuming cyanobacteria. And these toxic cyanobacteria are the ones causing those massive blooms on Lake Mendota, and so zebra mussels are probably compounding the problem. They're clearing the water of all competing algae, encouraging much larger and more abundant toxic cyanobacterial blooms. So what does all this food web ecology mean for humans? Well, it causes a decline in water clarity, and it's been estimated that a one meter loss in water clarity is valued at about $140 million. So we can actually put economic value on the costs of the food web changes, and especially the cost of invasive species. And then on top of all of this, there's also climate change that's happening. It's virtually impossible to be an ecologist these days without considering climate change as a real driver of populations, communities, and ecosystems. Thinking about Lake Mendota, for instance, the air temperature is getting warmer, there might be changes in cloudiness and wind speeds, we're getting more rain, and the length of winter is decreasing. Here you can see the historic record of ice cover on Lake Mendota. The ice cover in the late 1800s used to last about 120 days. Now that number is closer to 80 days. We've lost a significant amount of winter. The lake is freezing later and it's thawing earlier in the spring. So what does this mean for the ecosystem? There's lots of questions to be asked about how the changing seasons are going to affect organisms living in the lake. Also, Madison is getting wetter. This is the long-term 30-year average precipitation. You can see that in the last decade, it's been dramatically higher than the historic average. And this means that there's more rain falling in the watershed, and there's more big storms to deliver nutrients into the lake. So more rain is really posing a challenge for nutrient reduction in the watershed. And these trends aren't unique to Lake Mendota, but they're definitely happening here. And if we care about our water quality, we've got to consider how climate change is impacting ecology, both the ecology of the terrestrial watershed and also the ecology of the lake. There are so many abiotic and biotic factors that go into shaping this unique ecosystem. And as residents of Madison, it's one we care deeply about because it really shapes our city. So I hope this example of Lake Mendota helped to show that the scope of ecology contains a wide array of interacting levels of organization. Ecologists seek to explain life processes, interactions, and adaptations, the movement of materials and energy through living communities, the successional development of ecosystems, and the abundance and distribution of organisms and the biodiversity of the world. And while there's many fascinating basic science questions to be addressed, ecology has many practical applications in conservation biology, in natural resource management such as agroecology, agriculture and forestry, and also in city planning. Urban ecology has become a really popular field in the last few years. And ecology also plays a driving role in thinking about community health and economics. Healthy ecosystems support healthy people.